Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. On behalf of Pastor Brandon and the Macedonia Church family, we welcome you to Bible Study Night. Um, tonight, um, you know, well, hopefully everyone has had a great week thus far. Um, happy Veterans Day to those that um, are veterans. Thank you for your service. Um, we also want to say, um, you know, happy pastor's anniversary to our pastor, Brandon. Um, today is the um, anniversary of him being ordained as a pastor of Macedonia Church. So we want to wish him a happy pastoral anniversary as well. Um, thank you for joining us tonight on uh, as we continue our study in the book of Jonah. Um, tonight, we're going to be in Jonah chapter three. Um, the last couple of weeks we've been in the book of Jonah. Um, where we looked at how God had mercy on the prophet Jonah, um, and we'll get into a bit of a recap later. But um, the last couple of weeks we've been in the book of Jonah, and tonight we will continue that study of this, uh, you know, I would say interesting and relatable prophet of God. Um, relatable because I think a lot of his characteristics we can all relate with and look at ourselves and see you know, how, um, how, you know, kind of not things not to do. Um, but tonight, uh, our chapter three will bring us to the heart of Jonah's mission and highlights powerful themes tonight of repentance, mercy, and the transformative power of God's word. Uh, Jonah three will tell us about Jonah's second chance. He'll get a second chance to obey God's call, um, his message to the people of Nineveh, and their surprising response. Tonight, we're going to look at even more of God's abundant, abundant mercy. We looked at how he has had mercy on Jonah. And tonight we're gonna look at how his mercy uh, is, goes even beyond um, Jonah, um, the Hebrews and such. Um, and just a reminder, the mercy of God is God's compassion and kindness that forgives people and withholds punishment even when it's deserved. So he's withholding the punishment that we so deserve. So we thank God for his mercy and his grace. Um, and, you know, and how God is just so willing to forgive even those that are farthest from him. We as humans may not be willing to forgive those that are seem farthest from God, but God um, in his, in, you know, in his sovereignty and in his loving kindness is willing to forgive those that are farthest from him. So we'll delve into that topic and um, a lot more and just looking at God's mercy um, tonight uh, and, and how he had mercy, like I said, not only on Jonah, but also on the people of Nineveh, um, which were a Gentile wicked people um, that we talked about the last couple of weeks um, and how God, even in even even those people that seem so unlovable, um, that were so wicked that, you know, did some evil, evil things that, like I said, in our own minds, we wouldn't think that they are lovable and forgivable, but God um, wants all to be saved. He does not want one to perish. God is a loving God. He's a kind God. He wants all to be saved. So we're going to look at that tonight. Um, Paul said in First Timothy that for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So God desires, as I said, that we all be saved. And tonight we're going to see that play out as Jonah goes to uh, Nineveh. Like I said, the Gentile people, it's not the Hebrews, it's not God's chosen people. It extends even beyond that. Um, and uh, Sister Nikki, did you have a comment? I do, Sister Kawana. Yes. Um, just to, a scripture to support uh, what you are saying. It's Second Peter 3 and 9. And this was also laid on my heart while I was reading the lesson and answering the questions. And that scripture, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance so just a scripture just to support what it is you're saying thank you so much i appreciate oh. that and that's so timely and um as i would say this lesson is definitely so timely um if we see you know god our father is has this mind and this is the mind of god that all men be saved and even as sister nikki read that scripture you know you see his heart that he doesn't want any anyone to to perish 
Um, and I think it's so timely of a lesson right now, even as Pastor Brandon went forth on Sunday with this election season and people so against each other and, you know, wishing hate on each other and all of that stuff, you know, this helps to kind of show us that that's, that's not what it's all about, you know, especially for Christians. Like, you know, we should be having the mind of God. We don't want to be like Jonah. We want to be, you know, like Christ-like and, um, you know, the, the mercy that God is looking to extend to the Ninevites, as I said, the, you know, horrific people that they, that they even were, you know, who, who are we to go in, you know, kind of not be able to extend that same mercy to our brother or sister, even if they are unsaved or seem unlovable. Um, so with that, um, let us go before the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask Sister Bernadette if she would open us up in prayer. Good evening, saints. God bless you. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you are great and greatly to be praised. We thank you, Lord, for just another timely lesson, as Sister Kawana has said, just showing us what repentance can do. The results when a nation, Lord, humbles themselves and turn to the true and living God. Our sincere prayer tonight is that you will have your way, that you would have your way with our nation. Cause us once again, Lord, to seek your face and turn from our evil ways. You gave us a promise in your word that you would hear from heaven and you would forgive our sins and heal our land. Father, our nation needs a healing. Our nation needs your divine intervention. Come, Lord Jesus, have your mighty way and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, God, just have mercy upon us as you did with Nineveh. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Send a mighty move of God. Send a mighty revival one more time. Open up the heavens, Lord. Oh, God, and send the rain. We pray tonight, God, have your mighty way. God, let our eyes come open to see what you are doing in the realm of the spirit. And God, have mercy on America. Tonight, we pray, Lord, that you will bless us, the Kawana. We uh, anoint her with your wisdom, anoint her with your unction, Lord. Give her clarity of mind, give her clarity of thought. And you'll be glorified tonight in this Bible study. And as Sister Kawana mentioned, Lord, we especially thank you for our Pastor Brandon celebrating two years of pastoreth. Lord, have your way with him. We thank you for him, a true man of God, a young man that loves you, Lord, a young man that said yes to your will. Have your way with him. God, we know the best is yet to come. Hallelujah. Oh, you, we're just getting started, Lord. The best is yet to come. We thank you for his next year of increase, favor, and fruitfulness. Bless him tonight. Bless his family. Bless his children. And God, bless Macedonia Church and all those who are online tonight. To give us one mind. Give us one thought. Give us one. Uh, uh, just have your way in Bible study tonight, and you'll be glorified. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that powerful prayer. Um, it's, you know, so such an awesome prayer, such an awesome lesson, the lessons that we've been having on, you know, starting with the prophet Daniel, and now we're in the, uh, you know, book of Jonah, just awesome lessons. And I, you know, I just feel like, you know, we got to think about and see like how we can apply this to our lives. And even as Sister Bernadette, you know, our nation is in such turmoil right now. Like these are such, such timely lessons that we can apply to our lives and, you know, help us to be better Christians and, you know, just better, um, you know, disciples of Christ so that people will know who we belong to. Um, so we're going to just jump right into the lesson tonight. Um, you know, we're going to kind of try to stick to the scriptures tonight. I'm just going to go right through the scriptures. We're going to kind of, you know, I'm hoping that this will be a very interactive dialogue tonight, a lot of kind of questions. And, you know, I would love, love to hear comments and dialogue because um, we're going to really try to contain ourselves to the 10 scriptures tonight because we do have a couple of other lessons in Jonah coming up. So don't want to kind of step all over um, into anything. Um, but, you know, so let's, you know, kind of be willing to participate and love to hear everyone. And so here we go. Um, so by way of introduction, um, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have to admit that we do not have a deep burden to reach the loss for Christ. 
So question, what do you think has caused this lack of concern? Thoughts on that? Um, you know, this lack of concern for, you know, reaching the loss, as I said in the intro, God, God wishes and, and God, you know, desires that all men be saved. So why do you think that there's such a lack of concern these days for the lost? Sister Jennifer. Uh, many factors can actually, well, they do contribute to this. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was that a lot of us, I'll just say us or just people in general, are self-absorbed. Um, it, it's about us, you know, God, what about me, 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 whatever. And But you don't know what's going on with your neighbor. You know, we're living in, you know, um, these beautiful neighborhoods or whatever, but but people are not they're going through, they're not saved. We're just so, it's us, you know? And then it, sometimes it could be, I'll obviously give other people a chance to answer, but I was thinking about being self-absorbed and then um, people having a fear of, of approaching people or not knowing how to present Christ to someone, even just in a simple conversation. Like those are the few things that come to my mind. Amen, amen, love that. Um, Sister Amanda Davis, then Sister Purdue, and then Sister Shirley Matthews. Um, I was going to say that when we don't spend time with God, we don't have God's heart. So when we don't have God's heart, we don't love like we should. We don't care like we should. So just lack of time with him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, Sister Purdue and then Sister Shirley Matthews. Um, for myself personally, I found that it's kind of difficult, um, to reach out to people um, because of um, trying to talk to someone, explain, I'm trying to witness to them and talk them about God. They are so quick to tell you the faults in the church and the different things that hinders them from doing whatever. So it kind of makes it kind of hard and discouraging, even though we still try to pursue, but then too, you don't want to take on that south, south, uh, self-righteous attitude or get frustrated to where it caused you to come out of character, if you will. And um, sometimes for me, I, I have that problem. And the only thing I do at that point is pray. And sometimes it makes you feel like, why bother? But then you have to stop and think and realize that somebody prayed and interceded for me. And it, and it had someone did not continue to minister to me or reach out to me, I may not have come to Christ. So I find I feel like sometimes what I had to do is just pray and ask God to give me the mind and also help me get to the point that when I do share as he leads me to do it, not in my own self, if I feel he's really given me to lead a minister to someone, I just be obedient to what he's given me to do and then let him take it from there. I just do what he's commissioned me to do and just step back and allow God to work whatever way he desired to work and just continue to pray for the individual until God chooses to, you know, change the heart or they, they decide they want to accept Christ in their life. Yes. Amen. Amen. I love that. And I, you know, think about our, you know, prophet Jonah here, he had his own, you know, thoughts and, uh, you know, his own hangups with the people of Nineveh to where it clouded him being obedient to God because God wanted to do something in him and in Nineveh. Um, the first, you know, but we'll see that he ultimately was obedient, but, um, yeah, the, he, he, because of his own hangups, he, um, you know, he was disobedient to God. Um, Sister Shirley Matthews and then Elder Stanrod. Along with what everyone else had said, which is definitely um, selfishness you can think of that you just, um, it's all about self. But I also want to point out that sometimes people feel reaching out to the lost is solely the responsibility of religious leaders and missionaries and you know they seem disengaged from the personal outreach um the bible told we all should go out that is not it's irrespective of your um position or title in the church and also inadequate training because a lot of um religious organizations they lack training on how to effectively communicate their faith so they shy away from outreach and evangelism and sometimes it's your own self-doubt as, as um sister uh, Purdue just said you have your own struggle about your faith it may she didn't say that part but just you know to add on to it it could be about your faith that makes you hesitant 
to share your beliefs. You know, you feel that you don't know enough or you don't pray as someone else or you're not as deep as somebody else. But you can, even with what you've learned, you can share the gospel with someone else. Amen. These are all awesome, awesome nuggets. We're all ministers of reconciliation. And, um, you know, I think it's, you know, we, 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 you guys not looking for eloquent words and all of that. We often say that here. So, you know, if we just be obedient to God, you never know what he can do through us. Um, you know, and like you said, not with a title or anything like that. It could just be, you know, just, you know, anybody could just speak to speak life into a person who needs it at that point in time. Um, Elder Stanrod. Yeah, I was listening to um, what Sister Amanda was saying and based, you know, on my own walk with the Lord. I know, you know, as I, you know, really go after the Lord and draw closer to him. Then I find myself getting the mind and the burden of the Lord for souls, and sometimes it's not so much, uh, you know, uh, 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 it's not so much of just witnessing to somebody who's having a burden that God has laid upon your heart, and you're crying and weeping over soul people that, you know, you pass by them, you know, you could hear something on the news, and it just burden your heart where you want to pray, and I, you know, it, it, it's like that when you draw close to the Lord, it does happen because in my walk with the Lord, I mean, I'm picking up burden for people that I don't even know. But because God laid upon me, and I know sometimes, even if you don't get to verbalize or say something, but the prayer does make a difference, you know, by you praying, somebody else could be the vehicle to, you know, to give them the word or God could draw them in church or wherever, you know, or God would open the door for you to witness. But I know, you know, in, in, I, at case some point, I said this one thing and I, I, I finished. I remember an experience I had one time, really going after the Lord. And I was at this wedding and I was there and it was a festive time, but all of a sudden this gentleman... He was not one of those guys who wrote, I'm so proper, I was under direct him, whatever. And he was there. And my heart was so burdened for the guy I was there sitting in the wedding. And I was just crying for him. I don't know why. I was just crying for the guy and praying, Lord, save this man. And believe it or not, the guy died, I think, maybe like around within the month he passed away. And I didn't know all of that. But because, you know, God was pleading for his soul, pleading for his soul, having me praying for him. Maybe others have prayed also. But our relationship with God does make a difference having the mind and the burden of the Lord. Otherwise, like Jennifer said, we get self-absorbed, woe is me, you know, my cares, my this and my that. But when we draw close to God and all of a sudden, you can't help but get the, the mind and the heart of God in, you know, in, in winning souls and praying for somebody else. Amen. 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 Love, love the comments. Love the comments. And we want to just start out with that to, you know, start thinking about our own lives and how do we think about, you know, reaching out to the lost for Christ and, how do we think about how we interact with our brother or sister? Um, and is it, you know, is it aligned with the mind of Christ and in the heart of, of Christ? Um, you know, Jesus spent most of his ministry around, you know, sinners and, you know, prostitutes and tax collectors. He didn't shun those people. He, he embraced those people. Um, so how do we, as, you know, as, you know, uh, Christians, how do we extend that same, uh, love and mercy um, to those that are around us, those that are lost, those that need Christ. Um, Brother Isaac? I think today, day and age, a lot of people are more focused on how do I grow in ministry and how do I grow, you know, how do I get more influence, um, especially, you know, this generation, and then less focus on how do I reach out to people? And they just like, how do I upward mobility, like, get, like a corporate type mindset, you know, in the church? And I think that's a big issue that I find. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree, which is so sad. And I think aligns with what Sister Purdue said. And, you know, as soon as you talk to somebody, they're quick to say, you know, how bad the church is and how hypocritical and, how you know they don't see what they can gain from from the church, so it, it is an issue for sure. Um, okay, any other comments before we move on? Okay, so uh, oh, Sister Bernadette. The other thing, as we are seeing in this lesson, um, that how Jonah had certain prejudices. I'm see if I'm saying the word right, and that's 
sometimes even us as Christians, we're prejudiced to witness to just a certain group of people and, you know, it's human nature. If they look good or smell good, then we're more, you know, likely to say something, you know. And so God, as Elder Leroy was saying, that God just wants us to have a burden for the soul, you know, no matter how they look or how they smell or, you know, or they're refined or not refined. But that's the burden I'm leaving with this, these lessons that we've been learning that we do have certain prejudices, you know, and some people even, you know, they'll just, I'm a, you know, a, a Black American, maybe I'll just witness to Black Americans, you know, I, I won't go to my Caucasian, you know, people. So God really wants to break up the prejudices that's in our heart. And as you started the lesson to say, we can relate to Jonah. Definitely. We can relate to Jonah. Yes. Yes. Amen. Um, brother Isaac, did you, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, amen. Love all the comments and just totally agree. Um, so let's move along. Um, for the benefit of those who are just joining tonight or on our series of Jonah, just going to do a quick recap to get us up to Jonah 3. Um, as I said earlier, a couple of weeks ago, we started Unit 3 of the Union Gospel Press Sunday School book, and we started our study in the book of Jonah. Um, the book of Jonah is one of the minor prophet books in the Old Testament. Um, it's not minor because of its importance or its insignificance, but it's just one of the shorter books of the Bible. Um, so in Jonah chapter one, um, we see God telling Jonah, his prophet, to go to the great city of Nineveh to deliver a message to them that their wickedness had come before God. Um, and as I said, Nineveh was a very, very wicked nation. They would skin their enemies and, you know, put impale them and put them up for display, you know, sacrifices. They worshiped all kinds of pagan gods. Um, so, so, so God told Jonah in chapter one to go to Nineveh and deliver a message that their wickedness had come before um, him. And then instead of God, uh, instead of Jonah, I'm sorry, obeying what God told him the first time, um, as we discussed, he decided to rebel. He, he got a rebellious spirit on him and he decided to go the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. He, he got on a boat from Joppa and went to Tarshish which was over a thousand miles away from where God had told him to go to Nineveh. Um, so that would seem very irrational. And many of us would question Jonah's sanity. Um, if he was one of our friends or brothers, you know, God told you to do something and you go the complete opposite way, go way out of your way to, um, you know, to, to, to not have to do what God is telling you to do. Um, but our lessons the last couple of weeks brought out that Jonah's mind was such in a state of rebellion um, and disobedience because he let his own personal feelings, as we've said, um, about the people of Nineveh overshadow the task that God had for him to do. Um, it caused him to be misaligned with God's will, um, which we said earlier is that all men be saved. So his own rebellion, his own personal feelings got in a way of him being aligned with God. And, um, you know, as I said, we don't, we don't want to end up there. We don't want to end up there. We want to be um, as Sister Amanda said, we want to be um, aligned with God. We want to know the heart of God. We want to be able to obey God the first time. Um, you know, and side note, Jonah did have a reason to not, you know, like the Ninevites, right? As I said, they were wicked people. They were known to do very evil things. So um, not saying that he didn't necessarily have a reason to feel the way that he felt. And, you know, if we're all honest, as we've said, um, we at times feel this way about certain people, our own selves, where it's hard for us to, you know, minister to maybe a boss that we don't really like, or, you know, a, a um, you know, a, a friend that, you know, is not really a friend or a family member that, you know, has hurt us and God is saying, go minister to them. So we've been here, like, you know, like Sister Bernadette said, we can totally relate to Jonah. Um, so he had a reason, definitely. Um, he didn't want to go anywhere near Nineveh. Um, it was a hard task for him. Um, but, you know, just food for thought, Jonah rebelled and went on a ship in the complete opposite direction. Um, but, you know, God is omnipresent. Um, so, you know, Jonah really couldn't get far. He, and, you know, as we know in, in Jonah chapter two, as, um, or, you know, as uh, God was dealing with Jonah when he went on the ship, God sent a storm, a very, very um, tempestuous storm. 
Um, and Jonah was on the ship with some pagan mariners and the ship started to rock so hard that the mariners thought it would break. These mariners were so concerned for their life that they ultimately threw Jonah overboard um, at, at Jonah's request, which we talked about last week, so that the storm could cease. As soon as they threw Jonah overboard, the storm was calmed. But that wasn't the end of it. They threw Jonah overboard, but he didn't drown unto death. You know, um, as we talked about last week, God sent a great fish. He sent a great fish to swallow Jonah up from the water. And this is where Jonah sat for three days and nights in the belly of the whale. It was isolated, dark, underwater, but he didn't die in the belly of the fish. Um, but through God's mercy, the mercy of God, he allowed the fish to swallow Jonah up so that he may come to his senses and turn back to God, which we learned last week. He had a short but powerful prayer while in the fish's belly that ultimately showed his now alignment with God and willingness to go and obey what the Lord had told him to do in the first place. So Jonah was in this belly of the, the, the whale for three days and he had time to think and he had time to turn back to God and had a very powerful prayer and his heart was now aligned with God. Um, so he was ready to um, you know, obey God at this point. And once God was satisfied with that, he told the fish to vomit Jonah out onto dry land. And here is where our lesson picks up tonight in Jonah three, um, Jonah. So Jonah just got vomited out by this you know, great fish onto dry land. And God comes to him a second time to tell him to deliver the message to Nineveh. So this is where we will jump right into our lesson text. Um, we're going to pick up in Jonah 3, verses 1 through 2. Sister Alma, can you please uh, jump on and read Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So we see here the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And um, as I said before, I just want to say it's it's best to, to follow the word of God the first time. As we see, Jonah didn't follow it the first time. And look at how much time he wasted. Look at how much money he wasted. He paid to go uh, you know, over a thousand miles away from uh, where God had initially wanted him to go. Um, you know, not obeying God the first time will cost you. However, God's grace and mercy, you know, allowed Jonah to be able to have a second chance. Um, and so, but I just want to say that, you know, that if we don't obey him that first time, it can cost us a lot. And, you know, God, God is the, you know, the holder of mercy, right? So we don't, we don't want to, to tempt God or we don't want to, to chance it, right? So um, we want to obey him the first time um, to avoid all of those um, extra costs. Um, so his grace and mercy um, allowed, like I said, Jonah to be uh, vomited out by the whale. He gave him a second chance. Um, he said that, uh, you know, arise and, and go to Nineveh. Once again, he said that. Um, and I think uh, we serve a God of second chances. That is the, um, you know, kind of point of this, these two verses of scripture. Um, and I, we had a little excerpt in our book that summed it up nicely. Um, could I get a volunteer to maybe read this slide, please? Um, Sister Shirley Williams. One of the most encouraging things we learn about God and his word is how willingly he gives us a second chance to those who have been disobedient. This is one characteristic that set him apart from the pagan gods of the nation that surrounded Israel. Those gods were often viewed as continuously angry and vindictive. The list of people in the Bible to whom God gave second chances is lengthy. It begins with Adam and Eve, Cain, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph's brothers. Soon we read about Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. Later, God gave second chances to Elijah, David, and Manasseh. In the New Testament, God continues to work with Peter, John Mark, Paul, and others. Each life is a study of God's mercy and grace. We fit right in. God has forgiven all who believe in Christ and offers 
them second chances. God's grace towards Jonah should produce deep gratitude in every heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I thought that was a beautiful um, summary in our book um, of, you know, like it, like in the scripture we just read, God gave Jonah a second chance. Um, Jonah was in complete rebellion, um, but he gave him a second chance to obey um, because that's the type of God that we serve. God is not looking for perfection. He's just looking for a willing vessel. Um, and as I said, we don't want to walk around like Jonah where we reject the assignment God has for us to do. Um, to where, you know, we would have to make God, you know, send a great fish and a storm for us. Um, you know, but we just want to be able to be willing vessels, put aside our own thoughts, ideas, and feelings, um, and, and, you know, just let God's will be done in our lives. Um, so after reading those verses of scripture, um, what was different about God's second command to Jonah compared to his first one? Um, Deacon Sean. Um, in the in the first one, he didn't give any type of specifics of what he wanted to tell the people. And in the second one, he gave him um, specifics and what he wanted him to say in detail. Amen. Thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, as 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 uh, Deacon Sean said, he God was kind of like strategic in how he, um, you know, gave detail or gave instruction to Jonah. Um, I, I just wanted to say here that we see the first time God came to Jonah, he he told him, I want you to cry out or preach against Nineveh for the evil has come before him. Versus the second time, God simply said to Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh and preach the message I tell you. So he's going to tell him the message, you know, uh, verbatim, but he didn't exactly tell him right up front this second time. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, and one commentator I read said that the story of Jonah demonstrates why many times God leads, uh, leads us one step at a time without telling us more. When God told Jonah um, what he would say in Nineveh the first time where he said, cry out for their evil has come before me, Jonah, you know, kind of had that information and rejected that. Um, but, you know, God often tells us, you know, strategically what we can handle at each time. So I thought that was interesting. Um, so moving along, what made uh, Sister Merle? <clears throat> and I was just trying to look back at the scripture, but I think too in the first one, he told him to cry out against it. Yes. Yep. And then you have this situation now, he, Jonah now has been in the belly of the fish and has this repentant heart now. And I think that when he tells him now, this time when he gets to tell them to go, he tells him to preach to him. So right. it's like the first time he was like, Jonah, you're going to kind of, you know, when I think of it, it's like, you're going to preach against them. You're going to cry out against their sin. But now that Jonah has a repentant heart, he's kind of going with a different heart and mindset. Now he's going to preach to him because he's messed up himself. So if they're messed up and God forgave him, you know what I'm saying? Yes, it's almost yes. like he's going with a different mindset. I don't right. know. If exactly. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how I thought of it. Like, Oh, okay. Cause his mind, he, like almost like he could receive it differently. So God like knew that and, you know, uh, kind of presented it to him differently, you know, same, same, uh, you know, task, but his mindset um, was just, you know, different at this time. Um, so what made Jonah's assignment so difficult for him? And can we relate to this same feeling today? Sister Linda? Oh, Sister Linda, I think you put your camera on and instead of your mic. <laughs> um, it said that the city walls were tall and wide and um, that they also had a reputation for cruelty. So that kind of made it difficult because he primarily avoided it because he didn't want God to spare the Nova. Yeah, amen. Um, absolutely. Any anyone else? What made it what made his assignment to go to Nineveh? Like just think about, you know, things that God asks us to do and we feel like it's difficult. Like what makes these things difficult to do? Can we relate to this? Um, sister, or sorry, Elder Stanrod, Sister Shirley Matthews, and then Sister um, McFarlane. 
Yeah, one of the thing also, Jonah just believed that these people just deserve the wiped off the earth. Um, one of the commentators was saying the Assyrians were so barbaric that even people who were being, you know, held captive from wars and whatever, they would rather commit suicide than go through some of the torture, you know, they would impale people by putting, you know, I guess, stakes, you know, through their bodies. They would cut off heads and there was so much evil that Jonah just rather these people just be gone. And I'm partly, you know, it was done to Israel also. So he just wanted him be gone. And, you know, it, it, yeah, that was my point. Yes. Amen. Um, who did I call next? Sister, I think I said Sister Shirley and then Sister McFarland and then Mother Jean-Pierre. Yes. Um, to tag on to Elder Stainrod. Stain Stainrod, yes. Um, our reluctance to forgive. And, you know, sometimes we resent people, um, you know, toward, he resented toward the people of Nineveh due to their reputation and being an enemy of Israel. So, you know, a lot of times we'll question God, well, why is, you know, you see how bad that person is and why would you extend mercy to such a wicked person, in, in this case, a wicked nation? And that's a struggle that we face when asked to forgive and extend grace and mercy to those that we believe, that we think don't deserve it. But as you said earlier, you know, um, Jesus sat with the sinners. He sat with, you know, um, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, everyone. He came for the lost. He didn't come for those that think they know it all. And it's a personal bias. Um, you know, sometimes we grapple with, you know, what we believe and we don't know how to show compassion and don't have true understanding of God's word and how it can change and transform someone. Yep. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, I thought of, uh, you know, it's not easy to minister, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not a walk in a park. It's not a cakewalk. So I feel like, you know, Jonah had to leave his home, you know, he was in Joppa and go 500 miles to Nineveh and, you know, deal with people that are, you know, possibly going to reject him or even skin him alive. So, um, and God's asking him to get up and minister to these people. So I can only imagine how, you know, ministers and pastors feel when they're dealing with some difficult people, but, um, yeah, it's not, it's I say not one more thing. Oh yeah, um, this one is um, also you just hit it on on the head. But sometimes we struggle with accepting God's will and accepting yeah. His plan, and it contradicts our own desires. And we have this internal conflict that we have to grapple with with accepting God's direction in our lives and how to approach things. And it goes against our natural nature. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mother Jean-Pierre and then Sister Mary and Sister Amma. So Mother Jean-Pierre. Gonna unmute. Um, Jonas too, he said God is a merciful God. These people they so wicked. And then he knows if you want if you go there to preach, and then God gonna save them. And he doesn't want them to be saved because they're so wicked. Mm -hmm. That's why he refused to go to 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 Nineveh. So he, he, he because he knows God is a merciful God. If he go there, he gonna preach. They're gonna accept, and then they gonna they wanna be saved. He doesn't want to be saved. He <laughs> want them to be, you know, <laughs> that they're so wicked. Judged, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But how many of us can relate to that? You know, we're like, man, we know God is gonna forgive that person, but we don't want them to be forgiven. Um, Sister Mary and then Sister Alma. Yes, I can relate to that. When I first got saved, like um, the people I used to hang with, I some of them were so, I didn't get along with them. And I was like, I hope they're not in heaven. <laughs> I was <laughs> sure. And then, you, of course, I grew up in, in the Lord. But yeah, so God, I was thinking about how God never gives us in assignments that are easy. We have to go outside our comfort zones. And Hosea was one of the counterparts, or he was in the time frame of Jonah, and God told him to marry a prostitute. And I was thinking about Ezekiel and Jeremiah. God told them to go preach, whether people hear you or not, just go preach. They're not. In fact, God told them they're not going to listen to you. So Jonah, it wasn't any different than all the other prophets, because 
the assignments that God gave them were pretty difficult to do. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Awesome point. Um, Sister Alma and then Sister Bernadette. Uh, I wanted to share one of the scriptures uh, about when God said, you know, take no thought for, you know, wherever you have to go or what you, not even for what you have to say, but he said, when you get ready to speak, it's not going to be you speaking anyway, but it'll be the Holy Ghost. So I can right. share. Yep. Amen. Amen. We don't have to worry about what we're going to say. God will give us the words um, if we trust and rely on him. Sister Bernadette. Just quickly, I just wanted to reiterate this point about their um, the wickedness of Assyria. In, in chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord says, uh, told Jonah to cry out against the city for their wickedness is come up before me. And I read today that that phrase there, the wickedness has come up before me. It was like, it it was so full. They said that the wickedness of Nineveh was so full. Like it just like come like straight, like you would have a mountain like coming up. That's how it was so full coming up to God. And when you read about them, they were so barbaric. They, I read they would, um, I think it was saying skin people alive and, and and kill boys and girls and take their heads and make them as monuments and stuff. So it's like their wickedness was full. But in this, you see God's mercy because you then you compare it to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom mm -hmm. and Gomorrah didn't get this this chance. Nobody was running through Sodom and Gomorrah crying out, you know. But here, God had mercy upon them. And but even even in that, Jonah also could have might have been fearful for his life. Because yeah. this is how wicked they were. I'm not telling <laughs> people they, for you know they have me beheaded, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, amen. I thought about that too. I'm like, well, I probably would have been like, mm -mm, I'm not going there <laughs> so I could get killed. Um, but yeah, that's that is amazing. I'm um, Sister Merle and then Deacon Sean. Um, but when you think about Jonah. We don't really hear a lot of the other things Jonah did, but Jonah was probably was a prophet. So he did minister to probably his people. I think we read in our book or someplace that he is one of the only prophets that we see that God actually sent to a foreign nation. Mm -hmm. And we have all of these reasons why he wouldn't go. But we see that Jonah had, must have had a place with God. And the only reason I say this, he had a place with God and he understood the heart and the mind of God because he knew, he clearly knew why he didn't want to go, even though all of those things were real, the the torture and the, how they'd impale people and skin, skin them alive and all the things that they, he, they did. But Jonah understood that God was a God of mercy. And clearly he had to understand that because that's why he didn't want to go because he really knew that if in fact he did and being the prophet that he would have been to share what he was going to share, he knew that there was going to be a change. So it, it you also see that even though he was rebellious and disobedient, he, he had a place with God He or he understood God and the character of God. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we'll get into, um, you know, Jonah chapter four, I think next week or the week after. But um, you'll see that, you know, Jonah was 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 mad, mad that they <laughs> repented. So um, we'll definitely get into that. Um, but was there another hand that I saw? Oh, uh, Deacon Sean. This kind of just piggybacks on uh, what Sister Merle was saying, but uh, up to this scripture, up to this point, it had to be a real trust relationship between God and Jonah, because other than that, this is the only time he re resented what he was about to do, and him going there finally after the, the coming out of the fish and uh, actually going there, God really just anointed him to do what he was about to do. Cause I think about it, like that's like a, uh, a slave standing up on a plantation saying, you know, you guys need to free us. And he know, he just seen a couple of them got their behind whooped and foot cut off and all this crazy stuff. But now he got and told him to go tell these people repent. You know what I'm saying? And not knowing that the consequences are going to come behind that are severe. 
It's not if they're severe, you don't seen it happen, you know it happens. So um, I just think that this particular time, that's why I think God gave an opportunity for him to change his mind because up until now, we had not, you know, it doesn't show any other re time of rebellion that Jonah had had with God. So as a prophet, he had, we can s safely assume he always did what God asked him to do. And that's why he came to him with this because he was trustworthy enough and he knew if he could just get him to understand um because god is love mm -hmm. and because he could love that way he couldn't jonah finally understood god's love like we understand he loved us so much he gave his son for us you know what i mean so that's all yeah amen amen thank you for that um so we'll keep on moving Sister Alma, can you please um, hop on and read Jonah 3, 3 through 4, please? So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Amen. So Jonah has learned his lesson, as Deacon Sean just said, that, you know, resisting the will of God is counterproductive. So Jonah now obeys the call of God and goes to Nineveh. Um, Nineveh, it says Nineveh, a great city. It's mentioned a couple of times in the book of Jonah. Um, their reputation for wickedness and them being known as this uh, great city. It's not saying that they're a great city because they had great character or anything like that. It's more so talking about their size. They had, um, I think somebody said it earlier, they had a hundred feet high walls and their walls were three chariots wide. Um, and they had just a large population. I think it was like 120,000 <laughs> um, population at the time, whereas other cities might've had like 30,000. So it was a great, city in regard of its you know stature its size the amount of people the amount of resources not certainly not great from a character perspective or anything like that um so you know again as we said before these things could have made jonah intimidated at first to go there um but he went he he um you know obeyed he went um you know he again turned back to god and and he went um so what was the specific message that God, uh, what was the specific message God had Jonah give Nineveh? Sister McFarlane. Yes, he uh, proclaimed God's word. He said that within 40 days that God was going to bring uh, death, destruction, and they would have a terrible faith. And as Sister Merle was talking, my mind went to Jonah being a prophet. So I can imagine him walking that area of Nineveh, uh, proclaiming the words of the Lord and how the fear must have been upon the people. I was like, oh, my God, you know, you're telling us death and destruction, like turn from your wicked ways. It was just kind of awesome just hearing Sister Merle uh, talk about his ministry. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, as Sister Angela said, it, his message was short and simple. Um, you know, it, it didn't tell them to believe in God. He just simply proclaimed that the impending doom was uh, of the city was to happen in 40 days. Um, why did God allow a grace period of 40 days? And what does that reveal about him? Sister Amanda Brown. Thank you, Sister Kawana. Um, God allowed a 40 day grace period to provide the Ninevites an opportunity to repent. And this was evidence of his mercy towards um, those who are living far away from him. And it also mentioned in one of the studies I did that um, like the number 40 is a significant number in the Bible. Um, and it usually represents a time of testing, transformation or significant waiting. And we could see that with um, uh, the rain that fell 40 days and 40 nights with, jo uh, with Noah during the flood. Then you had the 40 years that the um, Israelites had to wander in the wilderness. And then our Lord Jesus, he had 40 days of fasting right after he was baptized um, by John the Baptist and filled with the Holy Ghost before his ministry went into full effect. So this was a significant number in like the spiritual realm. And it was amazing. And I just want to add to what Sister McFarlane and Sister Merle said, the Ninevites understood what um, Jonah had said when he said destruction. 
because they were masters of destruction. So if they had any idea of what they had done to others coming upon them, they would, of course, not want that treatment. And God gave them grace to turn during this 40 day window. Amen. Amen. And that's a that's a nice thought, uh, you know, a nice uh, tidbit on the 40 um, days because I didn't even think about that. But, yeah, that's that's a pretty good uh, point to bring out. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, uh, I'll get you in one second, Sister Bernadette. Um, so yeah, they, you know, God could have, God could have immediately gotten, uh, destroyed these people. Um, just like Sister Bernadette earlier said about Sodom and Gomorrah, he could have not sent the message. He could have just wiped them out. You know, Jonah could have come with a different message. Um, so yeah, the 40 days he allowed them that time, that grace period to repent. Um, Sister Bernadette. Sorry, I hit the wrong thing. I promise it's the last thing I will say. No, it's okay. <laughs> but what stirred me up was Jonah's message. He cried and says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So we don't hear of him preaching any anything else. You know, to me, I'm thinking that's all his message. But can you imagine him coming out of that fish? And anointing that he preached those few words with the power that came out of his mouth and the anointing and the convicting power of God, you know, because he's coming out of the fish's belly for, you know, God saved him. And I just thought that that trial he went through brought forth the power of those words, you know, so it would resonate in, in those heart, the hearts of the people because we don't read him. We don't hear of him preaching anything else but just those words. Yeah, amen. I thought I was kind of going back and forth with that too. Like, well, did he say anything else? And maybe that's all they put in there. But um, I think I'm with you that, you know, he had to have power with God. Like God, you know, he was yielded to him, you know, spending that time with him in the fish. Um, just, you know, God is like, I'm going to speak through you. And just the power of God speaking through you. Like you don't need to say much. You don't need to uh, do it with a lot of, you know, pomp and circumstance. You don't need strobe lights. You don't need, you know, all of these things. Just the word of God um, can can cut to the hearts of people, which is what happens in Nineveh. It can, it can cut deep. It can meet you right where you are. Um, so, Sister Merle? <clears throat> I, I was laughing, but not in a, a, I don't know why, but as Sister Bernadette was thinking, talking, I was just thinking, like, it's not like a three day fast sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And my mind just, as she was talking, went back to days gone by um, that there were times when we used to fast and, you know, we come in on a Friday night and forget it. You know, you put in those three days of fast and you break that fast. You came into church, you were ready. But as she said that, I just thought about that. And so the power that came from him fasting is also an example to us just to turn our plates down sometimes just to get before the Lord those three days. He had no distractions because he was in the belly of a well, a fish, no distraction. And what a difference it made because I'm like Sister Bernadette said, I believe that when he came out and when he opened up his mouth, like she said, those few words that he spoke, they had to have some power for it to have impacted those people of Nineveh the way it did because immediately they received it. So there had to be some power behind it. And that power came from some fasting and some prayer. <laughs> amen. Amen. Absolutely. Those three day fasts, you'd be ready. <laughs> um uh Elder Stan Run. One thing I, I was thinking about Jonah, um, because the Bible say after the fish vomited him and how he, he entered the city within a day's journey. So it seems to me like, uh, because he went a long way from where God, from Nineveh. So while he was in the belly of the fish, the fish was also his, his ride to his destination. <laughs> so when the fish vomited him out, you know, he had a short distance to go, you know, and I believe through that time also while he was there, you know, God was just setting up everything so he could go to the right place, the right time, you know, to deliver the message. Amen. 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 Um, Sister Mary. I was going to say also about that fish. I was, when I was studying it before, the um, Ninevites, they worshipped Dagon, which is a fish god. So God kind of 
I don't know if they saw, I don't know where that fish vomited Jonah out, out, but I don't know if maybe they heard about it or they saw it, but I think God was trying to make a statement also, you know, with the whole fish thing, because that was one of the gods. It was a fish god. It was half man, half fish. So I, I think maybe some Ninevites had seen that also, and that affected them. And they were like, oh my goodness, what is this supernatural thing that's going on? So I think God was getting their attention all kinds of ways. Yeah, amen. That's a good thought for sure. I didn't even think of that, but yeah, that's uh, that is definitely plausible. I would totally be having my ears perked up if the man that just came out of the fish was just vomited out, came on, you know, down the street talking about, you know, um, doom and gloom was going to come. Um, Sister Amanda Brown. Yeah, just follow up on what Sister Mary said. Um, in some of the actual writings of history of the Assyrians, they have uh, records of Jonah and they call him uh, Yauna, the fish man. So they knew he had come out of the fish. However, mm -hmm. that story got through, right? Um, they knew he came out of the fish to deliver this message to them. So that would have also, you know, supported what Sister Mary said that God was making evident that he's greater than their fish God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for um, bringing that out. Um, awesome. Awesome. So let's move along. Um, so Jonah had just uh, given and delivered the message um, and he's, you know, walking around Nineveh giving this message. So let's see um, the response, the response here. Sister Alma, can you please uh, jump on and read Jonah 3, 5 through 6. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Amen. So what three things did the people of Nineveh do after hearing Jonah's message? Sister Alma. They, the three, they, three things they did is they believed God, they proclaimed the fast, and they put on sight clock. Then I want to share something about the sight clock. Absolutely, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay, so sight cloth and ashes were used in Old Testament times as a symbol of debasement, mourning, and or repentance. Someone wanted to show his repentant heart would often wear a sight cloth, sit in ashes, and put on ashes on top of his head. Sight cloth was a coarse material usually made of black goat's hair making it quite uncomfortable to wear and the ashes signified desolation and ruin which is what they were facing if they didn't repent amen thank you for sharing that um yeah so as sister ama had said they they believed god they proclaimed a fast and then they put on sackcloth they essentially became low in spirit they humbled themselves um, upon hearing Jonah's message, they believed God. They believed that this destruction was going to come if they didn't turn from their wicked ways. So um, I believe that they really humbled themselves at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, they, these, uh, putting on a sackcloth and proclaiming a fast was kind of external um, evidence that they were truly repentant. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Sister Sandra Hart. I thought it was awesome the fact that they believed God. I didn't, you know, any know anything about the fact that they might have thought that he came out of a fish or saw that, you know, what Sister Amanda and Sister Mary were saying, but the fact that they believed the word of God. My thought was that the word of God came forth from Jonah with power and conviction. And just for them to believe the word of God from them being a great city, as you know, the scripture says they're a great city well fortified. Mm -hmm. And they believe the word of God. That shows that the, the word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So that was just powerful to me. Yes. Amen. Amen. And just the obedience, too, of now of Jonah. Um, we see that his obedience, you know, the second time around, obviously, look at what you know, look at what God did on the other side of that, right? He used him to speak a word to these people, seemingly a simple message, just a simple message. And, and look at how, um, you know, essentially the word, 
you know, touch their hearts so that they are repentant. Um, and then not only the people, but the king as well. So that brings us to our next question. What did the king do? Um, Sister Jennifer and then Sister Purdue. So the king, um, he put aside his royal robe, covered himself um, with sackcloth and sat in ashes, um, humbling himself before, before God. And what I love of what the king did was that you saw his heart posture. He was the king of Nineveh, but um, he was able to take off all of the royalty and just ignore it for that moment and just humble himself before the real king of kings and the Lord of lords. And because his heart turned, as well as the people, um, God changed his mind. Amen. Amen. I thought that was beautiful, too, um, what the king did, because he took it even a step further. Um, you know, he, he took off his robe, which you know, back then a robe was a big deal. That was like, you know, a, a picture of your status, uh, you know, uh, it had jewels on it. it. You know, the robes were a big deal back then. The trains were long. So the fact that this king would take it off and put on goat's hair and sit in ashes, um, you know, he was truly um, repentant. And I think as a leader, um, you know, with great influence, like a lot of our natural leaders today do, um, I think that this, you know, this is this is key, right? Like if imagine if, you know, our leaders of today in the in the government and all of that just, you know, humbled themselves, humbled themselves and procre proclaimed a flat a fast and you know, proclaimed that everyone needs to, you know, pray, then a national day of prayer or, you know, days of prayer. Imagine if our leaders in America would do this how, you know, the people the, would follow, the people would follow all of this, you know, um, Democrat, Republican, and, you know, all of this hatred, all of this uh, debauchery. Imagine if our leaders kind of took this posture that this King of Nineveh did, how it would, you know, spread throughout the land. Um, so I thought that was beautiful too, of how the King responded as well. Um, so Jonah's message to Nineveh was straightforward and brief, as we said. Why do you think such a simple message was so effective? And how can we apply the lesson of a simple message when sharing our faith with others today? Any thoughts on that? His message was simple. Yeah, um, Sister Merle. Well, I'm not sure what you're looking for, but I think the one thing we, we've concluded that even though his message was simple, the message had to have some power behind it. So it's like there, there had to be something about Jonah from that time that he, you know, finally was in that fish and spent that time with God. And whatever went on in that fish between God and Noah, I mean, sorry, God and Jonah gave Jonah a change of heart and allowed him to go and do what God did, told him to do with obedience, but there must have been some power behind it. And, um, and I think it says, apply the lesson, uh, sharing our faith. I think that today it's kind of like, we have to take every opportunity in a sense to try to share our faith. I'm not the greatest witnesser, but is what I try to do when I'm in certain places if an opportunity comes up for me just to share something, I just share something. And sometimes it might just be a simple invite. You know, I know that there's so much we can do. I can say and share, but I may share something or say something and say, well, you know, start talking to them about church and then start talking about church and what happened in my life and how it changed and just give a simple advice. I think that today that's what we have to do. We have to start just reaching out to people and, and sharing our faith in whatever way God allows us to do it, whether that's in a restaurant or at, at the grocery store. And believe it or not, something that I don't know why God uses it for me right now as a witness and to sometimes I'm in line and somebody ahead of me may be short of money. I'll say to the people, just, just put it on my tab or I'll just pay it. You know what I'm saying? 
but all of those things are witnesses. So I don't know if I went off. I was trying to read the question while I was talking at the same time. But I think one thing about that I was just really trying to say, he had to say what he said with power. And the thing is, when we talk to people, we have to be able to talk to people in a sense, you know, with an anointing. And we just want God to always anoint us. In order for that to happen, we have to do what as somebody said at the beginning, stay in the presence of God so that God can give us his heart and his mind. That when we talk to people, because the word says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. So if you're just having a conversation with somebody, you need to sometimes pray and say, Lord, just anoint me just to talk because it's going to be that anointing that will, in fact, break the yoke. Amen. Amen. That was that was perfect, Sister Merle. <laughs> um, Sister Vicky, and then Elder Purdue, and then Sister Shirley Williams. I think um, we're all pretty much saying the same point, but I feel like it's just to prove like God himself is the one that's behind it all. I know we're asking the questions like, oh, I wonder if it was because they knew he was in the belly of the fish, or I wonder if they knew everything that they wrestled with God. But I think that was kind of like a moment where God was just like, simple obedience is all I ask for. Like the powers within me, all I need you is to be willing and to be a useful vessel for me. So I really think it was, all of this is just reflecting the relationship that God has with us. And, you know, Jonah was just so happened to be the person God used that no matter how many times we mess up, we could do it all wrong. Everyone could be, you know, doing their own thing. But at the end of the day, I think it's really just showing the power of God. Like, God's the one in control and he just wants a yes. And then he's going to show his greatness through our obedience. Yeah. Amen. I love that. I love that. Um, Elder Purdue and then Sister Shirley Williams. Uh, yes. I was just thinking about uh, something that happened with Carol and myself. We went on a cruise and you know how you have the family night when you get all dressed up and sit around everybody and the couples that we had met from other parts of the country they begin to drink and they ask us that we want to have a drink. And we begin to say, the Lord delivered us from drinking. That whole night, Sister Kwana, they stopped drinking. So all you gotta do is just make a stand. You don't have to hold, do a whole lot of saying, just be firm in what you believe and God will do the rest. Amen, just simple obedience, simple just living out in front of people what you believe. Um, that's funny, that kind of brings back to my mind with um, when I first, uh, you know, when me and Isaac first like met and stuff, I was, you know, I was not saved. Um, and we had gone out, I think to a restaurant in city Island and I was drinking wine and he was not drinking, you know, cause he had been saved. Um, and he was not drinking. And I was like, I was like, you don't drink. And then he's like, no, I haven't, you know, drunk. And he's like young, right. He's like in his twenties. And, um, so that really actually, um, impacted me to where I too, I stopped drinking shortly after that. And I was just like, so amazed that this young man, you know, in his twenties wasn't drinking and he was able to, um, go out to dinner with me and like, you know, stand on that. So that, that actually still, I still think about that today, 14 years later, but, um, but yeah, that was that, you know, that kind of brought that back to my, my mind. So, um, so Yeah. Um, who did I call next? I think it was Sister Shirley Williams. Did you still want to share? Yeah, I was just going to say God uses us when we're transparent. The anointing can fall so quickly when we're open and not be embarrassed of our past, but to share what God has done for us. Just like Sister Merle said, he'll give us what we need at that point in time. Uh, somewhat what she was saying. That's all. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, we will keep on moving as time is going. Um, so we'll continue to look at this concept of repentance. Sister um, Alma, can you please read Jonah 3, 7 to 8? And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Amen. So the king took this repentance even further. He, you know, made a proclamation. He made a decree, which was a high order by a king. It was almost no revoking it. 
Um, once a king made a decree, that was, you know, basically set in stone. Um, so he was very serious about, um, you know, his nation repenting and turning away from their sin um, to the point where he even ordered the animals to um, follow this proclamation of repentance. Um, Elder Perdue. Uh, yes, I was thinking about the king. He set an example for the rest of the people. My mind goes back that we had some uh, literature or tapes on how presidents in this country would call a national day. He wanted everybody to fast and pray. I know people in the 21st century don't do it, but I think back, I don't remember what president, maybe somebody can help me, but when he called a fast, there was some change in America. Yes, yes, amen. And yeah, I remember some of those as well. Uh, Brother Curtis. Abraham Lincoln. Yes, Abraham Lincoln called that. Um, and I think we've read that a couple of times during some of the Bible studies, but it's so powerful um, when when a leader and when, you know, when especially, you know, these people that run our land um, take this posture. Um, so the king made a, a decree, um, a high order to um, for everyone to turn, um, put on sack cloth, uh, cry mightily unto God. I thought that was powerful as well when he told them to cry mightily unto God and let everyone turn from their evil ways um, and from the violence. So he basically put an end to everything that Nineveh was doing at this point and had them, um, you know, humble themselves. So what did the fasting and wearing of sackcloth indicate and why were the animals included? Sister Purdue and then Brother Curtis. Uh, the sad thing and the uh, putting on sackcloth, where it, ref it would, um, refer to, like it indicated, like a genuine um, repentance, and also um, would have they include the animals as a sign of like uh, like a totality repentance of Nineveh, and it, the lesson brings out that it was it referenced or compared to um, I think Exodus twenty and ten when God concluded, included animals in the command of the Sabbath, Sabbath rest in, um, my glasses are slipping. Okay, when God commanded the Sabbath rest in, in um, Exodus 2010. I think I said it right, sorry. Yes, <laughs> nope, yep, you got it. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the, 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 this king was really serious about, um, you know, having the people, not even just the people, but all the animals and everything repent. He's like, we all have to humble ourselves at this point. Um, and I think Sister Alma had already addressed, you know, the sackcloth and ashes and um, kind of the meaning of that. Um, that was definitely a sign of um, repentance and a sign of just, you know, sorrow over their sin. Um, Elder Stanrod. Yeah, one thing I, I was looking at, you know, if you look at the history of Nineveh, you know, only God knew what the outcome would have been. And can you imagine if, you know, Jonah didn't go with the message from God? They probably would have been, of course, you know, destroyed and didn't get the mercy that God wanted to pour out. So it just let me know that you can't count anyone out. It doesn't matter how, you know, they look hopeless. You look, look at some nations now and some of the atrocities that take place, and you would think that they're outside of the mercy and the grace of God. But all you need is just one Moses, one Jonah. And I really see this happening in this revival because nations are given over to evil. Some nations, because they weren't, you know, founded like America were. But I really could see God doing this in some of these nations overnight, just turn it around. One anointed Jonah or a Moses or a deliverer. And this is what this revival is going to bring, bring about. Not only churches, but nations overnight going to be converted to Christianity. And I believe that that's the power that is coming. Amen. Amen. We're going to see true repentance um, through the power of God. So what is the meaning of true repentance in your own words? What is the meaning of true repentance? Um, Sister Nikki and then Sister Vicki. True repentance, I think, is definitely what this King had felt, but it's Isaiah 1, 16 and 20. As I was studying, it's not only feeling sorrow for the sin committed, but it's breaking off um, from that sin. And repentance must be doing something like 
breaking away from that sin, turning completely away from that sin. So it's not standing standing idle. And to add what um, sis, um, Elder Stanrod had said, I too, as I was studying, believe that, and, and Sister Bernadette mentioned it, and, and, and Sister Merle had mentioned it, but these, these three days with him, it was tailor-made, and, and Sister Mary and, and Sister Amanda had mentioned it. These three days that, that Jonah had, was it was a tailor-made preparation for ministry. But Nineveh, because of the preparation, like us, the consecration, revival, and in the heart to the spirit of God will cause repentance and revival. I truly believe that. And it is our responsibility to pray for all that are in authority, our leaders and our nation. Sister Kawana, I'm trying not to talk as much. I'm trying to hold it, but I can't, I can't. I'm telling you, I can't. It is okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. You can share as much as you want. <laughs> Sister Vicki and then Sister Purdue. I think um, the meaning of true repentance really comes from not just like your words, but your actions. Um, it's not just apologizing, but it's also like a change in character, not behavior modification, but just a true um, outward expression of an inward um, interaction. So if you really feel remorse, you really feel as though like, um, you know, conviction, it comes first with conviction and then your actions have to change. You can't say, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, Lord, I'm so sorry, I don't wanna do this again. And then you don't do anything to help yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to continue to do the work in you. So it's um, it's both. Yep, absolutely. Um, Sister Purdue? Yes, what I was thinking too, as I listened to Sister Merrill, um, she talked about the fasting back in the day, we used to do the three days and how we would come in and the presence of God would just rest. It's like I just got like a stirring because I remember some of the times when we came into the presence of God and how he the the, the anointing just rested and it pretty much commanded the, the praises and you could it's almost like um like a fabric being woven. It's like you could actually see the God moving and touching the different hearts of different hearts and of different ones um as he went through the the church, not everybody, but different ones he, he ministered to. And you could just feel it. And then what happened is like sometimes you got like a spiritual jealousy, not in a negative manner, but it's like you wanted to, if you weren't where you need to be at that point, the next time to call, or sometimes you would go on your own and ask God to lead you to go on the consecration to get to the place that God wanted you to be. And it just, I just had a flashback just remembering some of those days. And I just feel the presence of God. I say, God, do it again. Because I believe God is getting ready to visit us, and he's going to literally blow our mind. I'm still waiting for God to come in Macedonia, as he promised us years ago. He's coming. He's going to walk in Macedonia. He's going to fill the house with his glory, and everybody is going to go down, saint and sin alike. And God is just going to have his way. I am excited. This lesson is, is it just it stirred me up, just the presence of God that's getting ready to overtake us, and not just Macedonia. But we are forerunners, but we're going to get it first. Not being selfish, but God bring it on. I'm just believing God for it because of like an excitement. I just want to say one thing, and I'm going to set up again after this one. I thank God for each one of you teachers who's been teaching these Bible study lessons. I can't explain to you what's happening, but I'll tell you something. Hallelujah. I thank God for you all. I thank God for the research and for the time you're taking to put these things together. And even as we participate, I thank God for each and every one of you teachers that God has anointed to execute these Bible study lessons. I'm telling you, it's doing something in my sanctified soul. And the only thing I can tell you is I am so encouraged. I'm so encouraged. And I just want to tell you openly, thank you. Each one of you, I thank you for allowing God to use you to be the effective teachers that you are. That's it. Love you all. Love you, Sister Purdue. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. And I know all the on behalf of all the teachers, I, I'm sure, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so moving, we're gonna move ahead because we're gonna run out of time, but um, everyone pretty much stated, but just to sum it up, true repentance. Um, no one can pursue two paths in life at the same time. 
Thus, the main word in the Old Testament for repentance simply means to turn. In repentance, a person turns from sin and turns to God. The main word in the New Testament means a change of thinking. Repentance involves adopting a new perspective on reality, including a new view of sin, of God, and of ourselves. The New Testament also talks about an emotional response of remorse or regret, which goes along with repentance, but the feeling itself is not true repentance. Such a feeling can arise for many reasons. True repentance may start with remorse, but also includes a decision to forsake sin. So repentance then is a godly sorrow over sin coupled with a sincere commitment to turn from sin and live to honor God. It is, it is motivated not just by the consequences of sin, but by a realization that our sin offends God whether anyone catches us or not. I thought that was a powerful summary of what true repentance is. Um, and as it's been stated, we're praying for this for our nation, for revival to come forth in this way. Um, we'll skip this slide. So Sister Alma, can you please come on and read Jonah 3 verses nine? Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So what was the king's rationale for ordering the things he did? Sister Amanda Brown. Um, the, the book says his rationale was that maybe God would change his mind if he saw the change for good in the citizens of Nineveh. And Sister Kawana, when I um, read verse nine, like uh, Sister Alma just re restated, um, what came to my mind was is that Jonah's message didn't have hope in it. Jonah's message was a message of, of doom you know, 40 days and it's over, right? It wasn't, if you turn, you might get something else or maybe God will leave. It was just straight down the line like he had done with Hezekiah when he said, you know what? Set your house in order, you're gonna die, right? But the whole thing was God had called Nineveh and the Bible says that um, you can't come unless God draws you. And God drew them to himself and put it in this man's heart to do, if you will, like Hezekiah did. Hezekiah turned to the wall and offered up a prayer. This king turned his ways from what was evil and said, look, everybody stop. Let's do something different because what we've done is gonna get us killed and maybe we will get a blessing. And that's what I love about this particular verse is because it, it proves that God drew them to himself, like Sister Vicky said, because if God had not drawn them, they could not come. But because he drew them, they willingly all came and he saved an entire nation. Yes. Amen. Amen. I thought that was amazing, too, that, um, you know, this pagan king, how his thought process was, um, you know, because again, we can't assume that they knew anything about the scriptures or, you know, the God of the Hebrews. So it was amazing. I think proves your point that somehow, um, you know, they knew that they needed to turn. And, you know, I do believe God drew them to him. And, you know, they, in Jeremiah 18, um, seven through 10, it says, at one time, I will suddenly speak concerning a nation or kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if the people of that nation concerning which I have spoken turn from their evil, I will relent and reverse my decision concerning the evil that I thought to do them. At another time, I will suddenly speak concerning a nation or kingdom that I will build up and plant it. And if they do evil in my sight, obeying not my voice, then I will regret and reverse my decision concerning the good with which I said I would benefit them. So God is very clear, you know, if the nation... Uh, turns, then he will um, relent from his uh, judgment upon them um, and, and vice versa. Um, so I thought that was amazing too, that the king had this forethought on that. Um, so um, Brother Curtis, did you have a comment? Yeah, as Sister Amanda spoke, when Jonah, because Jonah didn't want to, God to have mercy and grace upon Nineveh. So when Jonah spake, he spake only of the destruction that was going to come to them. He didn't want to tell them about the mercy and about the grace of God. Uh, there's a scripture in Romans 3, 29 that says, 
is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles only. So Jonah didn't want the Gentiles to be included. That was his mindset. Yes. Amen. Um, any other comments before we move on? Um, Sister Alma, can you please jump on and read our last scripture uh, where we look at God's compassion, Jonah 3, verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he has said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Amen. So what was God's response to the people of Nineveh and the king? What was God's response? So um, God responded to, oh, Sister Merle? He basically did what the king had hoped. Um, the king hoped that maybe if they repented, God would turn, change his mind and not judge him. And that's exactly what God did. He extended great mercy and grace to them. Amen. Um, Sister Mary and then Sister Amanda Brown. Yeah, I was trying to figure out which king was this in Assyria because I remember Sennacherib giving them a hard time shortly after this so i think it was after this but anyway it's god's mercy and he was going to use nineveh to chastise his people because they're about to go into captivity by these assyrians so it wasn't time you know god spared them he spared an entire generation just for because he's a gracious and a merciful god yeah i think they you know ultimately the they were uh the men of the people of nineveh were um like 150 or so years after this, they were, um, you know, they were wiped out too by the Babylonians, I believe. So, um, yeah, so they, they didn't stay repentant, but yeah, as you said, it might've been like a later generation. Um, Sister Amanda Brown. Sister Kwan, I'm sorry, this is, this is my personal opinion, but in the book of Revelation, it talks about all tribes um, and nations and tongues will be represented in heaven, right? And I was thinking that this particular generation will be the generation of like the Ninevites. Like God calls every one of, you know, the nations, tribes and tongues to come to him so that we all will be represented in heaven. And it's just amazing to me that like Jonah didn't know that these were the called out ones that these were the ones that God wanted to pluck out from Satan's hand, right? Satan can't have all of these people. So God made a way and used his prophet to speak just one line to them and birthed an entire nation because God wanted those souls to be in his kingdom forever, you know? And I believe many of them got saved because that was the ultimate goal. He wanted them for himself to come to him. And when you put down your evil and turn to God, God said he would then turn to you and do you good as you just read. Mm -hmm. Yep. Amen. Amen. What a, what a awesome God that we serve. What an awesome God. What an awesome God. Um, Brother Curtis, and then we'll move on. Yeah. To answer sister Mary's question, um, Sennacherib was the king. Yes. Thank you. Um, so really quickly, how do we explain the fact that God repented of what he said? So does this, in, in verse 10, it said that God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. Is that repent like how we are, you know, how we repent from our sin and turn from a sin? Um, since we're running out of time, um, it's, it's, it's not repent as, you know, as in the human sense of returning from sin. It's other translations may say that he um, just would change his mind on um, what he had set out to do because it shows, um, you know, God's human, you know, reaction to our human nature. Um, so if we turn from our sin, although, you know, God, uh, you know, had said that he was going to send judgment to Nineveh, but because they turned, he, uh, you know, repented or turned or changed his mind on what he was going to, um, to do to them. So that word repent there um, does not mean like he turned, you know, he sinned and he turned from his sin. Um, so that in conclusion, Jonah showed a lack of concern for the lost. God, in contrast, showed great concern and compassion for them. 
Most of us are probably more like Jonah, as we said earlier. We may have, a, have had a greater love for the lost at one time, but our concern tends to weaken. Renewing our love for the lost starts with renewing our love for at least one lost person. Is there an unsaved person in your life who you could reach out to? Let us all take time to identify one person at least for whom we might have a greater spiritual concern and to think of ways to express it. Um, I put our practical points here. Because God is gracious, our past does not disqualify us from serving him now. Obey God, do not compromise his message under pressure and trust his power to protect you from all enemies. Speak the gospel plainly, as we said, trusting God to move hearts. God's word is for everyone. Our compassionate God desires that every sinner repents and turn to him. Share the gospel freely, knowing that God responds in love to those who repent. And with that, um, we'll uh, end the lesson there. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson on tonight. Thank you for every single uh, comment and nugget that was shared. Lord, we pray that you are pleased with our lesson on tonight. And Father, as it's been prayed earlier, we just ask that you have your way in each and every one of us. Lord, help us to have more love for one another, more love for those that are that seem unlovable. Father, give us your mind, your heart, your spirit, oh God. Lord, let us walk in, in, in the, the path that you have for us. Help us to be obedient in the assignment that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you for this lesson on tonight. Thank you for each and every person on this line. And Lord, you have your way in, the, in us all week long. Have your way in our leaders, Pastor Brandon, Elder Stevens. You bless them, oh God. Bless their households. Father, I thank you, oh God, for doing it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless you and have a great rest of your week.